at the judgment seat of Christ, again, it's for all believers from the church age. Not for everyone in human history, not for the righteous of the Old Testament, that's a different judgment. The judgment seat of Christ, or the Bema judgment, is specifically for all believers from the church age. So all who have been saved from the cross of Christ until the rapture of the church will be at the judgment seat of Christ and will individually be judged. But here's what I want to emphasize. You will not be judged for sin because as a believer, your sins were judged on the cross. And the moment you recognized your sin, repented of your sin, and received Christ, all of your sins were judged by the blood of Christ and you were reconciled to God and in right relationship through faith alone, through Christ alone, because of the cross. So you are not going to be judged for sin at the judgment seat. Your actions, your life, your motives, your integrity, the things that you have done, you can do good things with bad motives. You can do good things and have ulterior motives. We are going to be judged for our service, our life, and our ministry for the Lord. But if you are present at the judgment seat of Christ, your salvation is sure and your eternal reward cannot be taken away. If you are at the judgment seat of Christ, or the Bema judgment, you made it. And you'll never lose your salvation. And so again, you are not judged for your sin. It is not an opportunity for Christ to look at you and decide whether He's going to keep you or throw you back. Once you have made it to the rapture, through the rapture, and are at the judgment seat of Christ, your salvation and your reward and the joy of eternal life in Christ is forever settled. Now, the judgment seat of Christ, or the Bema judgment, as I've already mentioned, and it's coming up in a subsequent study, so if you do not already subscribe to the channels, be sure to do that. But there are seven final judgments, and the judgment seat of Christ is the first of the seven. I've oftentimes said, this age that we currently live in, this present age, is training time for reigning time. Because the Bible tells us that we will be raptured, we will be with Christ, we will be in heaven. There are a series of events in heaven, beginning with the judgment seat of Christ. But after seven years, while tribulation is going here on earth, there will be a second coming of Christ to the earth. And the Bible tells us that we will return with Christ. At the rapture, the Bible tells us believers are taken to be with Christ. At the second coming, believers return with the Lord to rule and to reign and will enter into a thousand year period of time called the millennium. And the authority that you have in the millennium, the responsibilities that you have in the millennium, the position that you have during that thousand-year millennium will be determined at the judgment seat of Christ. That's why I say this life here is training time for reigning time. Because when you return with Christ in the second coming, the Bible says that we'll rule and reign with Him on this earth. Now go down to verse 10 because I want you to see something that's important in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. The Bible said, For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil that we have done in this earthly body. And that brings up a good question that I'm oftentimes asked what does Paul mean by good and evil? Now, depending upon the translation of the Bible that you currently hold in your hand, 
the modern accurate translation. Some translate the word evil. Some translate it from the Greek as bad. But it does need a little explanation because uh, the Greek word is actually uh, phallos. And it's not important that you rememberize all of the Greek words from original manuscripts. But the original Greek word from the original manuscript is phallos. And it means, again, some translate it as evil, some translate it as bad, but it's important that you understand that it's not referring to evil in the sense of uh, wicked or uh, an abomination. It is really uh, a Greek word that means worthless or inferior in quality, not in the sense of evil or wickedness or unrepented sin. But what makes things in the judgment seat of Christ to be considered, as the Greek said, phallos, or bad, or evil? Again, not in the sense of wicked, in the sense of inferior or worthless. Well, what makes some of our deeds worthless is that they can be done with a wrong motive. Uh, the Bible speaks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And uh, I believe it's down around verse 5. It also speaks to us in the book of Hebrews in the 4th chapter and the 13th verse that it is possible that we can do good things, but we've done them with wrong motives. They are good things in themselves, but sometimes done for praise or for accolades or for selfish reasons. And though the work may result in something that is wonderful or, or good or advances the kingdom of God, we tainted that work with our ego or our pride or self-praise and they will be judged. Uh, I believe that's what the Bible is speaking about in 1 Corinthians 3 and 12 when it speaks about our works being tested by fire like uh, wood or or straw or hay, and they will be consumed, and only what is precious remains. Because God not only knows, don't miss this, God not only knows what we do, He knows why we do it. And you can fool people with things that you do and why you want them to believe you do things that you do. But God knows the intent of our hearts. You cannot, ref you cannot ever fool God, and you need to always remember that. And it may be that in heaven, at the judgment seat of Christ, uh, we probably think of certain people or certain ministries or certain people that have celebrity in the work of God, and we think, man, I hope I get to stand by when brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so is at the judgment seat of Christ. I want to see all of the rewards that they're going to receive. I personally believe that at the judgment seat of Christ, there will probably be examples of people that we thought would receive great reward. But when the fire of testing at the judgment seat of Christ, the beam of judgment, tests their motives, that there might be very little that remains. And the opposite, I'm sure there will be some people that you have never heard of, but they're going to stand before Christ. And the things that they did in secret, the things that they did that no church or no organization or no body ever recognized or rewarded or brought them to a banquet and gave them public praise or accolade, they'll stand before Christ and reward after reward will be heaped upon them because they did it only as unto the Lord. They did it only because they had a desire to please God, and they could have cared less who patted them on the back for that. So you remember, as you faithfully serve the Lord, and some of you in secret, and no one really knows, no one really sees. You're not in a platform that's highly visible. Don't ever worry about such matters. First of all, Promotion comes from the Lord, but at the judgment seat of Christ, we're also going to find that rewards come from the Lord and will be tested. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 16, 
that those who are last now will be first then, and those who are first will there be last. Uh, I read a true story of uh, a Catholic school, and at lunchtime, they had a table that had uh, desserts. And on this particular day at the Catholic school, uh, they had put a plate of apples, and by the apples, they had put a plate of chocolate chip cookies. And uh, there was enough on each plate for every student. And one of the nuns had written on a piece of paper uh, a little note that said, uh, by the apples, take only one, God is watching. And uh, this was told as a true story. But at the other end of the line where the plate of chocolate chip cookies were, one of the students had written a little note that said, take all you want. Remember, God is watching the apples. And <laughs> that story has always tickled me because a lot of people think that God is looking at certain things and his vision is blurred in other areas. But I want to be sure that I teach you today that God's not only watching the apples, he's watching the cookies. And he not only sees to us, he sees through us. And the judgment seat of Christ will reveal all. Now the judgment seat of Christ uh, actually serves two purposes. Uh, again, judgment seat of Christ, beam of judgment, same thing. But they have two main distinct purposes. The first purpose of the judgment seat of Christ is to review the life of believers. All believers are lives before Christ. And make no mistake about it, the scripture is clear. It is Christ, God's only Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, our Savior, our resurrected King of kings and Lord of lords. It is Him personally that we will stand before. And the scripture tells us that He will review our lives. I mentioned that there are two purposes at the judgment seat of Christ or the Bema judgment. One is to review our lives and the second is to reward our lives. The famous martyred missionary Jim Elliot once said, and it has been often quoted but still incredibly powerful, he said, and I quote, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Those who have faithfully served the Lord while living on this earth and poured out their lives for the service of the Master at the judgment seat of Christ will receive eternal rewards that they can never lose. And 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and 5, the Bible said, each man's praise will come to him from God. From the original text, from the original Greek, translated into my language, and if you're listening, probably your language, the English language, each man's praise will come to him from the Lord. Why is 1 Corinthians 4 and 5 so important in this study? Because there is where we find that the reward and the praise that comes on that day is not for a handful or a group of elites, but every believer, each man's praise. From the original Greek, and the word man is generic, it means male or female, every believer at the judgment seat of Christ will receive praise and reward from God. God is going to find something in every believer's life to praise and to reward. Now the New Testament focuses upon five specific rewards and I'm going to close our study by showing you these five rewards. Uh, the very title of our study today, what are the five crowns that are awarded to believers? Number one, the Bible speaks about the incorruptible crown. And I want you to keep your Bibles open because I want to walk through these and show them to you uh, in the scriptures. So 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verses 24 through 27. 
Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. Pause right there. Highlight, I run with purpose. Once you repent of sin and receive Jesus Christ and salvation and the forgiveness that comes from God alone, God created you with divine purpose. He has a plan for your life. Paul is talking about that here. He said, I run with purpose. Highlight that. I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. So this crown, this incorruptible crown, is a reward that is given to those who consistently practice self-discipline and self-control. And the Bible said it will never fade away. I want to just emphasize how important self-discipline and self-control must be in the eyes of God that He has created a crown, a reward for believers who take their lives and lay them on the cross and understand what John wrote in John chapter 3, and I believe it's verse 30, where the Bible said, He, speaking of Jesus, He must increase and I must decrease. To successfully live the Christian life, a life in the Word, a life in prayer, a life of loyalty and faithfulness and service to the Holy Church, a life of dedicating yourself to help winning others to Christ and sharing your faith and rescuing people from the curse of sin and sickness and poverty and bringing them in to the forgiveness in Christ alone. Self-control, self-discipline is absolutely of utmost importance in your success in the Christian race. Number two, the crown of righteousness. Number two, the crown of righteousness. Let's go into uh, 2 Timothy and the fourth chapter and go down to verses 6 through 8. This is the Apostle Paul writing his second letter to his protege in the ministry, his son in the ministry, Timothy. 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 8. He said, as for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. The crown of righteousness is the re reward for those who eagerly look for the appearing of the Lord's coming and live a righteous life in view of this fact. That crown is given to those who await the Lord's soon return and live their lives circumspectly because of the motivation that they know they will soon meet the Christ who died for them, rose for them, is coming again for them, and they live their lives with that motivation. Number three, the crown of life. Going to Revelation chapter 2, Revelation and the second chapter, verses 9 and 10. Number 3, the crown of life. 
Revelation chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. I know about your suffering and your poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those opposing you. They say they are Jews, but they are not, because their synagogue belongs to Satan. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you. You will suffer for 10 days. But if you remain faithful, even when facing death, I will give you, and here it is, the crown of life. Uh, the crown of life is also mentioned uh, in the book of James. And that's in uh, James chapter 1 and verse 12. Uh, James wrote, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life. There it is a second time in the scriptures. The crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. The sufferer's crown, the martyr's crown, it has various names. But it is given to those who faithfully endure persecution, suffering, trials on earth, and tests in life. Number four, the crown of rejoicing. The crown of rejoicing. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians and the second chapter. 1 Thessalonians and the second chapter, verses 17 through 20. Dear brothers and sisters, after we were separated from you for a little while, though our hearts never left you. We tried very hard to come back because of our intense longing to see you again. We wanted very much to come to you. And I, Paul, tried again and again, but Satan prevented us. After all, what gives us hope and joy? And what will be our proud reward and crown? as we stand before our Lord Jesus when He returns. It is you. It is you. You are our pride and joy. This is oftentimes called the soul winner's crown. And it is a crown that is very dear to my heart because even as I'm reading Paul's words, uh, it it, it speaks to me because of a life dedicated to world missions and evangelism and traveling the globe uh, ever since I've been 17 years old and until today. 56 countries of the world. I understand what Paul meant that he was at places and left those places and he had a desire to return and to see people who had been saved under his ministry and friends that came as a result of salvation and the church and fellowship and co-laboring together for the cause of Christ. And I, I very well understand what Paul said when he said, a, a piece of my heart is with you. Uh, there are probably people who are listening right now. Uh, a piece of my heart is with you. A piece of my heart was left where you lived. A piece of my heart was left where I've preached and where I've prayed and seen friends or family or even perhaps you come to know Jesus Christ. And no one can fully understand that unless they've experienced it because it's one of my, uh, I don't want to call it a test in the sense of something that irritates me, but it, it breaks my heart in a way because every person whom I see in my world travels who comes to Christ, I, I wish I could be a pastor to all of them. I wish I could be there and have a Sunday service and, and be a pastor and stand before a congregation and watch those people grow and, and walk them through the, the trials and the battles that they may face. But as an evangelist, that has not been afforded me. So it's very, very dear to my heart, this crown. I pray one day that if by God's grace, I kneel before him at that judgment, that perhaps I might be awarded the soul winner's crown. Because in my heart, there is no greater joy than seeing men and women and boys and girls come to know Jesus Christ 
and the miracles and the changes and the healings and the testimonies that come in. And every time I read one, I wish I could personally be there uh, to share it with you. But my life doesn't afford that. But I am so thankful that everyone whom I have ever had the privilege of leading to the Lord, that number it seems conservatively may be now over a million people in my 43 years of ministry whom I've had the privilege of praying with and seeing them personally and publicly repent of sin and receive Jesus Christ, though I may never see them again this side of glory. In heaven, I will have all of eternity to catch up on wherever we may have left off. And then fifthly and lastly, the crown of glory. The crown of glory. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5 and uh, verses 1 through 4. 1 Peter chapter 5 verses 1 through 4. And now a word to you who are elders in the churches. I too am an elder and a witness to the sufferings of Christ. And I too will share in his glory when he is revealed to the whole world. As a fellow elder, I appeal to you, care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you will get out of it, but because you are eager to serve God. Don't lord it over the people assigned to your care, but lead them by your own good example. And when the great shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of never-ending glory and honor. The fifth and final crown at the judgment seat of Christ is for pastors and for elders and those who have watched and cared for the flock of God. And the Bible said because these shepherds have been faithful to the Lord and they have been loving and gracious and they've done their best to oversee the people of God, God has a special reward for every pastor. You know, they have a Pastor's Appreciation Day uh, every month on the calendar. It's in the month of October. Uh, I don't think they've ever instituted an Evangelist Appreciation Month, but I get more appreciation than I deserve. But I, I want to just personally say here, I have great respect for every pastor. And I do my best to encourage them and to help them and to prod them on in the work of the Lord to be faithful. It's not easy being a pastor. Uh, many of you need to be cautious with how harsh sometimes you are with your pastor. Uh, a pastor's job is oftentimes very thankless because they oftentimes only hear from parishioners when something's not right. And they're very rarely praised. Some churches are, are very uh, honorable, but sadly, most pastors, they're constantly dealing with divorce and death and funerals and disease and discord and, and on and on and on. And they deal with that day in and day out. And many times the messes that they're cleaning up far surpass the victories that they get to enjoy. And I want to encourage you, if you're a believer, be faithful to a local church. That's commanded in Scripture, in the book of Hebrews. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. One of the greatest ways you can honor your pastor and honor the Lord and honor the commandment of the Scripture, be faithful and loyal to your local church. It encourages pastors in a way that you'll never know to see your loyalty and your faithfulness to the house of God. It's, it's a way of saying thank you without even opening your mouth, both to God and to those whom he has appointed to serve you. But pastors, uh, if you attend a church, uh, always go out of your way. Uh, for every time you have a, a difficult question for a pastor, uh, your praise, your encouragement, you know, just even a, a text, uh, man, that was a wonderful message. 
Let your encouragement outweigh your criticism 10 to 1 at a minimum. Đúng là 6. Đúng rồi, chỗ này nhân 2, chỗ này nhân 3. Như vậy 2 cộng 3 đó là 5 bi trên 6. Đây chính là pha dao động tại thời điểm 1 phần 30 giây đó là 5 bi trên 6. Đó là xong cái nội dung của cái bài số 3. Bài số 2. Bài số 3. Bít tông của một động cơ đốt trong dao động trên một đoạn thẳng dài 16cm. Như vậy các bạn nhìn chú ý nè. Đây là vị trí cân bằng ô của nó. Bít tông này sẽ dao động trên cái đoạn dài 16cm. Tức là từ đây đến vị trí này. Đúng không ạ? Nguyên cái vị trí này của các bạn là 2A nè. Đây là vị trí cân bằng. Từ đấy đến đây là 1A. Từ đấy đến đây cũng là 1A nữa. Như vậy 16cm này chính bằng 2A. Đúng chưa ạ? Bằng 2A. Các bạn lưu ý. Tức là người ta cho quý đạo dao động thì chúng ta suy ra được. Đúng không ạ? Người ta cho quý đạo dao động hay là đoạn thẳng dao động là bao nhiêu? Chúng ta sẽ suy ra được biên độ lấy quý đạo chia cho 2. Được chưa rồi người ta yêu cầu mình xác định biên độ dao động của một điểm trên cái tông như vậy biên độ a đúng không sẽ bằng là 16 chia 2 thì bằng 8 cm quá dễ đúng không mấy bài này rất là dễ các bạn giống như bài cưới ngựa xem hoa thôi chứ không có gì cả rồi bây giờ chúng ta qua bài số 4 phương trình dao động điều hòa là x bằng 5 cos 2 bt cộng bi trên 3 Hãy cho biết biên độ pha ban đầu và pha tại thời điểm T của dao động là bao nhiêu. Như vậy, bây giờ bài này người ta cho biết đây là chính là bài số 1.8 trong sách bài tập của chương trình sách vật lý giáo khoa kết nối tri thức. À, sách bài tập kết nối tri thức của vật lý lớp 11 đó các bạn. Các bạn có sách bài tập, sách bài tập người ta ra rất là hay. Các bạn mua về các bạn tham